All right. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to When Boring is Good, ensuring a consistent installation time for Rosa with hosted control planes. I'm Russ Lesky, and that is a mouthful of a title. Uh, so that's gonna be the last time I say that. So, or just maybe, instead, this is the art of being a potato, a lesson in not getting mashed by Spud Russet, your chief tater. You can be the, you can decide, we'll see. So what we'll do, um, do the obligatory who am I, because my name is not Dan Walsh, so you probably don't know my name offhand. Uh, we'll do a little level setting to know where we're on the same page, some of the terminology, all that fun stuff. Uh, we'll go through some of the goals that we had, some of the testing we did, and then where are we going from here. So who am I? That's me. Hi, Mom. Uh, so Russ Lesky, I'm currently in Pennsylvania, originally from New Jersey. I've been at Red Hat for 10 years. Well, OK, it'll be 10 years in three days, but I'm going to count that. It's close enough. Uh, I am the OpenShift Performance and Scale team lead. We cover everything for cloud-based OpenShift, all the core components, all the functionality, and clicking buttons when you don't mean to. Um, we do all of the self-managed uh, self OpenShift as well as our managed offerings, which is what we're going to talk predominantly about here today uh, with the likes of Rosa or ARO on Azure or whether it's OpenShift dedicated on Google Compute. Uh, Similarly, if you find this topic at all interesting, uh, there is a recent blog post I put up on the Red Hat developer page uh, on a similar subject covering a little bit of this, but a lot of other topics too. And that wonderful picture right there, just to show you that I do performance and scale outside of my job too, that's a uh, gravel bike ride that I did last year. It was, that was about after the 20 mile mark and after 1,500 feet of climbing. So from there, I got a beautiful view, but still had 100 miles to go and 10,000 feet of climbing. If that's not scale, nothing is. So let's level set. What are we talking about here? So to start with, we're going to talk about hosted control planes. That was kind of in the title, HCP for short. But what, what does that mean? What, is, what happens when I say that? Well, if we look at standalone classic OpenShift, we can kind of really break it down into two core components. You have your workers, which is where most people care about their stuff, right? That's where your app lives. That's where the money happens, right? Similarly, you have your control plane. Well, that's going to make everything run, right? Our Kube API servers there, our databases, our um, SDNs, anything. There's a, a ton of different services going on there. If we shift it to the hosted control plane view, we can use this magical, wonderful piece of software called HyperShift. This is a middleware layer that effectively allows us to kind of change that up a bit. We can now take our OpenShift cluster. So we still have a standalone OpenShift cluster. We're going to take that. We're going to call it a management cluster now. And that management cluster is going to host the control planes for other OpenShift clusters, right? So we can split that workload off. So, they, so from a customer perspective, you can focus predominantly on your work, right, on your workers, instead of worrying so much about the control plane, because that's all going to be hosted on this other uh, service. Now there's a bunch of benefits to that, right? There's, you get better stacking, more uh, efficient use of resources. There's, I'm sure, CapEx, you know, wonderful uh, cost reductions. There's a whole bunch of things at the bottom here. I'm not going to go through all of them. The one that we're going to focus on is really that one on the end, right? Where it's, we're going to talk about something be, it's faster to install. I can get to running my workload sooner, right? And that's, because that's really what I care, we care about. So what is Rosa with hosted control planes? Rosa uh, managed Red Hat OpenShift on AWS. Similar to ARO on Azure, like I mentioned earlier, or you know, OpenShift dedicated on you know, Google Compute or any of the other cloud offerings. HyperShift is, again, that wonderful magical middleware layer that if it wasn't there, this whole house of cards falls apart. Management cluster, or MC, that's the cluster that runs all those hosted control planes, like I said. Hosted control cluster, that's really just the API endpoint for a hosted control plane. It's many times interchanged with hosted control plane, which is those, those pods and the actual control plane that is running on the management cluster. I tell you this, but really, most of the rest of this talk, outside of eh, two slides, this is all applicable to just core HyperShift as well, right? So we talk about Rosa, and we're talking about it in that context, but really you can take this off to just core HyperShift when you're running just a management cluster and whatever else. So the goal. This slide is exactly the goal. It is uneventful. There's no streamers. There's no wonderful big balloons shooting out the top. We want an uneventful and kind of eh 
installation experience. You don't, we don't want you to remember it. It wants to just happen and we move on to the next thing. So what do we want? We want it to be boring, right? Because I don't want to remember that. So in short, what are we really looking for? Potato. You're smiling. So what is a potato outside of that obnoxiously cute little guy over there who's ginormous on this screen, right? A potato isn't memorable. If I'm going out to dinner, I'm going to my favorite steak restaurant, maybe it's a you know, plant-based steak, whatever, I'm gonna get that, and sure, it comes with a potato, and that potato might be okay, it might be good, but I don't, it's not really what I'm gonna remember. It's not what I'm gonna talk about tomorrow, I'm gonna talk about the steak, see how it was good. Similarly, it's a potato every time. I go into Whole Foods, I go for a russet potato, if I come back with a carrot, or a cucumber, or a can of soda, something went really wrong, right? Something broke. So potato's boring, and that makes him sad. But, you know, maybe it shouldn't make him that sad. So we look at this in the context of what we're talking about here in terms of installations. If you're talking about OpenShift, or any software, or hardware, or the bookshelf I put together in my, my office, right? If that installation was memorable, something went wrong. I had to call friends over, it took me four hours, I needed to file six support tickets because nothing was working. That's memorable. I don't want that to be memorable, right? Because if it's memorable, it was a bad experience. And in a lot of cases, that's the first interaction your customer really has, right? They might have read the docs, they might have seen a demo from your friendly sales guy, but they never really touch it yet. That installation process, that's that first interaction. And if that goes wrong, you, they might not come back, right? I'm not gonna buy that bookshelf from that brand again because, well, it was just a pain. More so, I might not buy from that company again. And that would be really, really concerning. So, potato is boring, we've established that, but perhaps that's good. See, he's smiling again, it's okay. It's okay, little potato friend. So be a potato. So what was our testing goal? What were we trying to accomplish the, here? Like, how did we kind of break this apart? So really, we were taking the Rosa installation flow for hosted control planes. We're gonna break it up into all of its core components, all of its pieces. We're gonna meticulously time out, find out where we're spending our time, where we're spending our energy, and figure out where there's deltas, where things are going wrong, where we can improve so we can become more boring. How do we do this? The short version, create thousands of hosted control planes. And I'm not embellishing that number, it was thousands. Do them in such a way where we're testing out different circumstances. We are doing them slowly, one at a time. We're doing them in bursts. We're running different workloads on them. They're different sizes. All in a way to help us find out where we're falling apart and what we can do better. So, how did we do all this? Two main tools that we used. HCP burner, or host control plane burner, burner, that is really a wrapper around the functionality of create, use, destroy, right? Simply, it'll allow us to create any number of host control planes in various different configurations. We can take those, we can run different workloads on them, we can have them be different sizes, last for different amounts of time, then it's gonna clean those up. But even more than that, it's gonna handle watching where we're spending our time throughout all that flow. We collect metrics, we're gonna eventually push them to Elasticsearch, and we're gonna put them in a pretty Grafana dashboard, because everyone loves a pretty Grafana dashboard. Come on now. KuBurner, KuBurner is that use functionality in there. That is what lets us do like the functional workload on any cluster, frankly. That's what our, one of our predominant tools are on the OpenShift performance and scale team. We use Kubernetes to really orchestrate and create different workloads that stress different environmental configuration, so maybe we're watching etcd in a certain way, and we wanna make sure our f-sync time doesn't go up to a certain number. Well, we can alert on that, we can watch that, and we can make sure we're on the right page. So, our testing. To really understand kind of where the testing is, we need to understand what our installation flow looks like. So this is the, I have my command lined up, I have all of my variables in, or maybe it's in a GUI and whatever, I now hit go. What happens when I hit go? 
That's when our clock starts. We're going to fall into a waiting state. Yay, exciting, waiting, woo. No, well, really what's happening, it's checking quotas. It's doing some pre-provisioning steps. Fairly uneventful. Usually lasts a couple seconds on the outside, 30 seconds. Very, very short amount of time overall. From there, we'll move over into this validating step, this validating phase. And really, that's kind of an, a newish thing here, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take an instance and we're going to launch it out in the customer's environment, right? It's a super tiny instance, like T1 micro size thing, where it's going to run a bit of code that allows us to communicate back and ensure the communication works back to you know, the mothership, right? If we can't talk to that management cluster over there when our workers are out here in this account, it doesn't work. Everything falls apart, right? So we gotta make sure that works. And if it doesn't, we wanna fail quickly. So we can then correct whatever the problem is and move forward. Ultimately, we hope to end up in that installing phase, right? So we're moving forward. And it's why like classic OpenShift install it takes a little time. But here we're really just creating hosted control plane pods. There's a slew of them. They get put up in a certain order. It's not overly exciting, but that's what we're doing there. Ultimately, the goal is to end up in a ready state, right? That's what we want to be at. That's where we want to effectively come to. And here, just as the asterisks, a ready state here does not mean that all of your workers are up and happy. It means that the API server is accessible, right? I can create a namespace. I can issue a few you know, user commands. It doesn't mean the 180 nodes that I requested are up yet, because that takes some time. It's kind of outside of the control from this. After all said and done, you will eventually clean up the cluster, hopefully years down the line. But that's for the most part. There are two other states in here I skipped over. There's a pending state that you should very rarely even see, even if it does happen. It's very momentarily. Uh, and then there's also an error state. I skipped the error state, because if something broke along the way, well, A, I hope it happens soon. And B, if it did, it kind of breaks the installation time, right? It goes to infinity. It doesn't graph very well. <laughs> so we're, we're going to kind of ignore that for now. So I said the, uh, that validating state. And if you look at this wonderful graph here, you can see whether you have any background in performance and scale or not, that those tall spiky bits, that's probably not good, right? We found out after doing our first few runs of this, and this is, let's just say it's 60-ish uh, cluster request creations, and we see this kind of bump, and we're like, huh, well, that's not good. And those green lines, that's not even, the, that's not the full installation even. That's the validating state. So that's that one little state taking 13 plus minutes at that one point, and that's not even the worst of it. The worst ones we saw were 20, 25 minutes. I mean, you might as well just install classic OpenShift at that point, you're getting close. Well, the yellow line down there, that's just the waiting phase, just to kind of show that it is really just a blip on the, the radar, comparatively speaking. The good news was, well, this was fairly easily resolved. We had a timeout in the instance that we deployed, kind of an overall 10 minute timeout. So you can see like it comes up, takes a minute or two to come up, executes code, that fails, cleans up, runs another one, it succeeds, great. Or if it doesn't succeed, it tries again, and that's where we get to that 20-ish, 25-minute mark. Well, the actual code that was running in that instance was stopping after five minutes. So if it didn't get that communication by then, it was just hanging out for an extra five minutes. So you bring that down, you tighten it up, make it a little cleaner. Reduces that, those spikes by half, almost. They still happen. It's cloud, right? Sometimes instances aren't going to come up, right? Sometimes communication isn't there yet, and there's not much we can do about it in a point except for plan for it, and try to retry. And I'd say this mostly to, as a reminder not to test in a vacuum. Because if we were using just straight HyperShift CLI, this was something we never would have seen. Because we would have been directly deploying our hosted control planes on the management cluster. We would not be going through the same uh, route and same pathways that our customers do. So always never test in a vacuum, right? So who likes napkin math? I do. Usually it's at a bar, right? You get a stained napkin, you get a whole bunch of numbers written out on it or, or code. So if I'm questing 80 hosted control planes, right? And let's, that number could be 80, could be 90, could be 8,000, doesn't matter. But we're gonna just say 80. I'm gonna do that at one request per minute. Well, each of those hosted control planes uses some number of resources. We're gonna focus in on the CPU and memory aspect of it. 
but each one of those is like 70 pods too. So it, it's a whole slew of stuff going on there, but we're gonna focus on the CPU and memory. Our existing management cluster has three nodes, let's say. They can't handle 80 clusters worth of capacity. We have the autoscaler running, right? The default OpenShift autoscaler, it's happy, happy to bring up nodes for us. It's like, hey guys, don't worry, when they, they, can't, get, they can't get placed yet, they're in pending state or unschedulable, un, un, uh, I'll bring up a node, don't worry. But just wait, I don't know, four or five minutes for that. So you get this, right? If we're saying our hosting control plane or our, our management cluster worker handles, let's say four uh, hosting control planes at max, it can handle that much load. Well, I'm requesting one a minute. All right, I filled it up. The fifth one can't land. Now we're waiting five minutes. I haven't stopped requesting. It's still coming on, it's still going up. So you get this kind of wave pattern where you're just building up and slowing down and slowing down and you get this gappy, frankly, ugly data, right? This is not a good thing. If you're taking 35 minutes to install, I can install a classic browser in 35 minutes on a good day. That's not good. Well, how do we correct that? How do we start thinking ahead? Because the default OpenShift autoscaler doesn't. It's, it's looking in the now, what, can I, what do I have? What do I need? This is where we turn to cluster proportional autoscaler. So this is a horizontal pod autoscaler that really allows us to take and buffer the space that we need. So if we say that three pods, three of these buffer pods equals one hosted control plane, and let's just say that hosted control plane requests three core and 12 gig of memory, right? We, it's not accurate, but let's just say that's a number because it's easily divisible by three. So each one of those uh, buffer pods is gonna say, you know what? I'm gonna take one core and four gig of memory. Pack in some fancy topology spread campaigns so we end up on three different nodes in three different AZs because again, Y3, highly available. We'll want to be multi-AZ as much as possible. And you get this nice spread out. We can start buffering. Well, the cluster proportional autoscaler has this ladder concept. And even more so, it lets us say, depending on the number of nodes or cores we have on our workers, we can create so many replicas. So now we're saying, well, let's say our, our default workers have 16 cores. Well, so that means if we have three workers, we're at 48 cores, we're gonna now reserve three of these pods, these three buffers, right? Those buffers are gonna equate to one hosted control plane. So we can save space. So now when those requests come in, you know, it's a super low priority pod, so it's gonna get immediately bumped if, there, if space is needed, so now, that is gonna cause the autoscaler to instead start scaling up before we actually need the nodes. Take it a little further, let's say when we get to the midpoint of our management cluster side, we, we have some number of hosted control plane pods that we plan on handling per management cluster. We get to the midpoint and let's say that's 12 nodes. Right? That's, we factored out that we're gonna need 12 nodes to handle that midpoint. Well, our front end load balancer says, hey, when you get more hosted control planes on it, we're gonna start throwing more at you because we wanna be cost efficient. You know, We wanna make as much use of those resources as possible, so we're gonna just really crank it up. So now we're gonna reserve more space. Now we're gonna reserve six of these buffer pods or two hosted control planes worth of resources. Maybe in your environment that needs to be eight or not, or eight hosted control planes worth or, or whatever. And then we can go a step further. We can say, well, when we get to the point of 27-ish workers, we will never, ever need to buffer more. Why? I don't know. Maybe your AWS quota's out. Maybe that's how much money you have to spend. That's it. Say, good night. All right, that's it. Well, we can just shut it off. We can say, you know what, no more. We don't need to reserve space anymore because we're never going to throw more at this. It's just going to stop. We're going to take a break. So now, put this into play. And what do we get? We get a graph that's much, much tighter, right? Much, the, all the data is squeezed. 
Yes, there are still deltas there, right? Sometimes that validating state takes a little longer. Sometimes nodes take more time to come up. It's, you know, there's still a bit of a delta, but it's so, so much tighter than it was before because we're reserving a space ahead of time before we need it. Well, let's take a look at this a slightly different way. These are two graphs of the 80th percentile of install times, right? Broken down, you have that little yellow bit in there. That's the waiting time. Then we have the orange is validating, and the red is the rest of is the actual installation time. So if you want to look at time to ready, you have to add all of those up. Well, by looking at the 80th percentile, we can effectively cut out some of that cloud variability, so we can really focus in on actual installation. So if you look, if you can actually see the install uh, the validating and waiting times. You can see between the two, they're almost exactly identical. So we can really say that this is a comparison of time to take the install, right? We're not, we're, all that other stuff is effectively factored out. Beforehand, 14 and a half minutes to install. That's just the installing phase. Move it to the, using the CPA, eight minutes, 50 seconds. It's almost six minutes worth of improvement. It's huge. Huge, right? That's going to really bring down time. It's making it so your customer doesn't have to remember it, right? It'll be done. You move forward. They're off to actually deploying their workload, and they're happy. They're not bothering you because they're waiting on their cluster to come up. So we've improved validating times. We've squeezed some of that in. We've planned a bit more ahead. Right? Because we can do that now. We can say, hey, I know how much roughly I need to buffer for, so let's do that. Where do we go next? Has anyone ever lived in an apartment or shared a wall with a sibling or a noisy cat even? Right? Your space, it's your space, right? This is, this is my area right now. I live here. Well, Bob next door. He's got a band. They practice 9 o'clock every night, and they are loud. They go on for three hours every night. So they're noisy. They affect me, even though this is my space. Well, same concept with clusters in general, particularly hosted control planes here, because we're, we're really saying we're on a shared environment. So a cluster that is three nodes, or 300 nodes, or maybe it's running a workload you know, Bob's Donut Shop, they have fantastic donuts, by the way. They have a job that runs periodically every day where it, it has this icing job workload that runs. And it just, it runs aggressively. It churns pods. It creates tons of resource usage and control plane spike. On the other hand, Bill's hamburger stand, he just has a static web page. Both of those two are valid use cases, right? They're, it's not that they're doing anything wrong but they have a very different impact on the control plane. Well, how do we handle something like that? How do we plan for some of these things? Well, in some of the very, very latest additions in the Hypershift code, we know we can say that once we get to a certain number of workers, well, we're going to start buffering. We're going to say, hey, we know we need more space for certain pods. And yeah, OK, you know what? Worker nodes on the host control plane, I'll admit, that's not always the most accurate predictor of usage on the control plane. However, it's consistent, and it's fairly reliable. Because we know, pretty factually, that three workers on a cluster is going to cause less traffic than one with 300 workers. right? That those 300 nodes just have more pods. They have more cross-communication throughout the cluster. They hit the database harder. There's just more going on. So similarly, we can look, take this and say now, well, in that 100 to 150 host control plane worker range, we need the Coop API server to have more memory. Now it needs 10 gigs. Oh, and uh, etcd, we're going to double that. So we're going to go up to 2 gigs. API server, we're going to add some more there. Even more so, we can say, you know, if we needed more CPU in there, we can add those into that too. This is not an exhaustive list. It would go down and down and down for any of the control plane pods you wanted to map out. So now, so 
before, what would happen, right? If we have Bob's Donut Shop here, it's a host control plane on my cluster, and I am a new install coming in, right? Right now, Bob's Donut Shop isn't doing any work, really. My cluster starts installing here, right, on that same worker node. Bob's Donut Shop kicks off its job. We're fighting for resources now because we did, we were just, we were in the same boat. We were saying these two things were the same, even though they're not. Well, utilizing this, we can actually start planning a bit ahead and saying, well, now if Bob's Donut Shop is here and the scheduler is gonna look at it and go, well, can I fit this pod here? No, I can't because my requests don't, aren't enough for it, right? So it's gonna be put somewhere else. Or if it does decide we're gonna end up on that same node, well, there's space, right? It, Bob's Donut Shop can expand and contract all at once. It has plenty of room to do that. So we have the benefit of install time. We have the benefit of more just longer term stability, right? We can plan ahead better since we know how their trajectory of utilization is going to change on the control plane. Even more so, we can scale higher. We can allow the customer to scale at higher numbers because we can plan for that. We can say in our, whatever our resource manifests are that, you know, at a point, these need X number of, of cores and gigs and whatever, and we can say there are, there's a node for that now. We can fit it. So what used to be a, a top of 60 or 90 nodes, now might be 500, right? Just simply by planning ahead. So we're taking it farther, right? We're more stable. We're getting a faster install. We're forgettable in that regard. And it's fantastic. Spud Russet said it best, be a potato. Thank you. Any questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, how did you come up with the numbers? Those numbers? The sizing or? So that was exhaustive testing, to be honest. So we would run, I mentioned Kuburner earlier on in there, where we were running that workload, that use functionality. We would run various different workload types. So like cluster density is one of our, our kind of a go-tos where we're creating a large number of objects and we're churning them and we're putting them through their paces. So we would then measure what that hosted control plane use, utilization was and then we can map that accordingly where things were needed. So at different breakpoints, we can say now we need more, right? So you can kind of plan ahead. And in some environments are gonna be different, right? Not all workloads are the same, but it gives us at least, gets us in the ballpark where we weren't even close before, so. Great presentation. Thanks. Um, and I know that most of it was focused on installation, but I'm kind of curious um, yes. if the preference scale testing uh, applies at all to sort of longer running clusters. Um, I find that like, you know, I also work on OpenShift, so yep. it's a bit of a, uh, but I find like we have really great coverage around a lot of our install flows, mm -hmm. and getting a cluster up, testing E2E on it. Uh, but then we, we, we destroy it, right? It's a sandbox yes. cluster. We don't keep it around very long. Yes. So when customers are running it for like three years, five years, eight years, things happen that we don't really account yep. for. I'm curious if that's something so, that your team. So I, I can comment on that to some extent, right? So I will say that I know that, that our, our QE arm does do some, some longer running tests for things like that. Uh, we are actually at the point now where we're kind of reevaluating some of our CPT use cases as, that's continuous performance testing to handle more of those kind of situations where we're leaving the cluster there for an indefinite amount of time, we're upgrading it, we're running different workloads on it, we're stressing it in a way that a customer might, and then we're kind of seeing when it breaks down and when things are, those specific KPIs start trending in the wrong direction. So we can get ahead of that. It's not fully there yet, but it will be hopefully soon. No, thank you guys very much. Thanks for having me.